Good evening. Welcome to Mental Health, Wellness, and Recovery. My name is Richard Weingarten. I'll be your host for tonight's show, Helping Families Resettle. On tonight's show, we'll discuss the resettlement of refugees from war-torn Afghanistan to living here in Connecticut. My guests on tonight's show are Farishta Ganjavi and Laura Nui are both involved in the resettlement efforts now underway in Connecticut. Laura is the lead coordinator of the co-sponsorship resettlement project in Brantford, Connecticut, which works in combination with IRIS, the Integrated Refugee Immigrants Services in New Haven. Farishta herself is an Afghan refugee who has been in Connecticut for several years. She directs and teaches an educational program called Elena's Light. Elena's Light teaches Afghan women the English they need to get their driver's licenses and citizenship papers. Before we hear from Laura and Farishta, I want to tell you the harrowing story of a family of refugees who have just arrived in Bridgeport from uh, Afghanistan. As reported in the New Haven Register this week, the Garmal family celebrated their first Thanksgiving in America at the home of Mrs. Garnal's first cousin, Shama Akherzai, in Mansfield, Connecticut. Shama hadn't seen his first cousin in nearly three decades. Mrs. Garmal, her husband, five adult daughters, and her three grandchildren arrived in Bridgeport recently after spending 10 weeks at the McGuire Air Force Base in New Jersey. At Shama's home-cooked Thanksgiving dinner, the family spoke Pashto over platters of roasted turkey and lamb, mashed potatoes, kebabs, and pulao, a traditional Afghan rice dish with carrots, raisins, and nuts. They were grateful to arrive with other refugees and grateful to reunite with family. But Mrs. Garmal was very worried about her son, whose student visa was running out in India. They knew it was very dangerous for him to return to Afghanistan, and they were working frantically trying to find a way for him to join them in Connecticut. The Garmal family escaped from Taliban-controlled Kabul, running for their lives. Several weeks ago, uh, Mrs. Garmal's husband, Khan Aga, who worked for the Afghan Women's Network, received a letter from Taliban saying their work amounted to American projects, and if they didn't cease their work immediately, there would be serious repercussions. Well, the family saw this as a death threat. Husai, the family's eldest daughter, who worked alongside her father, recalled how she couldn't sleep at night, her fear was so great. She said how she and her father moved their beds away from the windows, fearing the Taliban would fire shots through the glass. Husai's boss advised her to work from home. Then, when the Taliban began their sweeping offensive in Afghanistan, Husai and her family, thinking they would be murdered, they were on the run, changing the location daily, fearing for their lives. They were hiding at a U.S. military base in Kabul when Husai got the call, telling them to go to one of the airport gates and from there they would be able to board a flight. They were told they could not bring any of the bags they had packed, only the clothes on their backs, their documents, and any medications they had. On the same day, their father also got a call from the Taliban saying they had surrounded his house and were demanding to know where his car was. Quote, once we got onto the flight, Husay said, according to the register account, quote, we didn't know where they would take us, but we were so glad 
to be getting out of Afghanistan, unquote. From Cobol, the family went to Bahrain, then on to New Jersey and the McGuire Air Force Base for 10 weeks before coming to Bridgeport. Their second oldest daughter, Ranga, who is married, lives with her three children nearby in Bridgeport. Her husband is still in Afghanistan. At the Thanksgiving dinner, their cousin Shema tried to reassure them, saying, quote, that with their education, career backgrounds, and language proficiency, and living in a country that received, quote, 20 years of U.S. investment, unquote, they could make new lives in America, unquote. Husai's sisters, Marianne, 18, and Basmina, 24, both served as volunteer interpreters at the Air Force Base in New Jersey. Basmina, who had been a medical doctor in Afghanistan, hopes she'll be able to continue her career in the United States. Both women said their dream was to attend Yale University and be able to lead professional lives as medical doctors. They dreamed of one day going to the White House and meeting President Joe Biden. Their cousin Shema reinforced this saying, quote, you are safe now. You are free to achieve whatever goals you have, unquote. In Connecticut, more than 500 refugees are expected this coming year, with about half of them already here. They are relying on resettlement agencies like IRIS to help them start new lives. Like the Garmals, they are being settled near family relatives nearby. Let me turn to my first guest tonight, Farista. Farista, you were in a refugee camp in Slovakia, weren't you, before you came to the United States? What was that like, being in a, li living for many years in a refugee camp? Um, hi, everyone. I'm happy. Thank you for inviting us. My pleasure. Um, yes, before we coming to the U.S., we were in a refugee camp in uh, Slovakia. Um, not a few years. It was a few months because uh, the country we were wanted to come to the U.S., they didn't have a U.S. embassy there. Therefore, the United Nations, who accept our case, uh, took myself and my family mm -hmm. in a camp in Slovakia. We were along with other 12 families who came all the, to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, we were there for seven months. Seven months. Yeah, the mm -hmm. first months we weren't allowed to go outside. We were just in the camp and uh, they do all of the tests and examination on us until we all get ready. They make sure we are healthy. Then after that, we were allowed to go outside. Mm -hmm. And How old were you when you first came to the United States? Uh, 25, 26 years old. You were. And time. for you, what were the biggest challenges once you got here? The biggest challenge was... Uh, the language? Language. Mm -hmm. And being alone here, mm -hmm. not knowing anybody. And the bigger, bigger challenge was my dreams. Your dream. And your dream was? to help myself and everyone mm -hmm, nice. around. I really wanted to change the world. Mm -hmm. Nice. Like the story that you mentioned, I uh -huh. see myself on all of their brains. <laughs> and you, uh, you, you were engaged when you came here. You married your husband here, correct? Yes. And you've had two children, right? No, when I came here, I was engaged. There wasn't any children. Oh. But I was sure um, and I strongly agree I'm going to bring him here because mm -hmm. he's not just a husband. He was my love too, and mm -hmm. still. Mm -hmm. uh, I was lucky to apply for him. He came here in a short time compared to others, mm -hmm. uh, 17 months. Mm -hmm. And then we start our life here. Mm -hmm. Now we have two kids here, and the third one is on the way. On mm -hmm. the way, well, <laughs> and yeah. coming soon, I understand. It's coming soon, yeah, <laughs> in a couple of weeks. Your husband mm -hmm. works two jobs, doesn't he? 40 hours a week in each job. What does he do? Yeah, it, the U.S. life is similar, and also if you have a dreams, as I told you, you have to work double. Mm -hmm. He's working at Yale uh, as at a Yale, yeah. Yeah, mechanical engineer. He's a mechanical engineer. Yes, and also working at a different organization, a different company called Zygo. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the engineering department. I there see. Too. And you told me earlier that he was trained as an engineer in 
in in the in the camps. Yes, but then when he came here, he had to relearn engineering in order to practice it here. Um, yes, he got his um, electrical engineer uh, in the second country we were, but unfortunately that degree didn't transfer here. He has to do it all again to get another uh, second electrical engineer degree from here and mm. then uh, start working on different I see. companies. Okay, let me turn to my other guest, uh, Laura Nui. Laura, you're one of uh, 40, Branford is one of 40 co-sponsorships in the state, isn't it? That's right. That's an amazing thing for a state, a small state to have 40 different communities getting ready to, res to welcome and to resettle Afghan and other refugees, correct? Absolutely, and we're working with IRIS in New Haven, uh, and IRIS um, has this fantastic model that works well mm -hmm. uh, for resettling refugees, which is to send it out to the communities. We know our communities best, mm -hmm. and then we do the work and we um, get ready to welcome a refugee family. Mm -hmm. You said earlier to me that IRIS provides a scaffolding Yes. And you have to sort of fill out the house so that you can get the green light to receive the refugees. Exactly. Could you talk a little bit about the scaffolding and what sure. you're doing with it? Right. So IRIS has been around for 40 years, right? So they mm -hmm. know what they're doing. So um, I raised my hand as a leader uh, in Brantford, and I was sent... Um, all these documents. So, mm -hmm. you know, certainly there's a lot of bureaucracy mm -hmm. in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So all this paperwork IRIS provides, and this is kind of the step-by-step -step of what you need to do to get the green light. And once you get the green light, then your family comes on board. Mm -hmm. One of the steps that's involved is, of course, establishing committees, right? Mm -hmm. So we have 17 committees 17 in committees, my gosh. Could you name a, what a few of those are? 17 committees in Brantford. Uh, we have housing, we have education, we have fundraising, we have finance, uh, employment? we have ride, employment, and employment, employment. Mm -hmm. um, and we have 60 volunteers. Wow, 60 that's, volunteers, that's amazing. 17 committees, and this is for one family. So this is a terrific uh, communal effort. I've been working on this for eight months now. Wow, yeah. wow. And tell me, um, people volunteer to work with you, don't they? Yes. And this really calls on their sort of feelings of hospitality, a kind of a feeling of welcoming new people to their na to their neighborhood, to their community. Absolutely. You said that you had some of them write you why they got involved with, with Branford's co-sponsorship. Yes. Could you read a few I, of what I'd they said? I'd love to, I would love to. Um, I've asked uh, many of our members who are volunteers if they would, you know, there's a lot of worthy causes in the world, right? And I just said, you know, why this one? Why, are, why do you want to work with volunteers? So I'll read a couple of quotes that were sent to me. Um, when I heard about this group, it resonated with me. Both sets of my grandparents were World War II immigrants and were lucky enough to have family already here to help them. I feel strongly for all refugees and want to give back. Mm -hmm. Someone else offered, to those who much is given, much is expected. Nice. Someone else quoted Winston Churchill. We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. That's so great. Beautiful. That's great. Um, someone else offered, um, I live by the golden rule. Mm -hmm. Whatsoever you do for the least of my brothers and sisters, you do for me. Nice. Um, nice. And I'd, I'd say one of the... Uh, do one more, please. One more, sure. Um, what resonates with me is the sense of a greater community, not limited to Brantford, but indeed mm -hmm. the sense that we live in the world mm -hmm. and the obligation we have to that larger community, truly something bigger than ourselves. Wonderful. So this is, you know, this is heart work, right? And these are people who live their values, yeah. right? They you walk their you talk. You mentioned to me earlier that they have a moral compass. They have a moral compass they and they wanna, follow they, it. They want to do good in the world. They want to give to the world based on what they've been given also. You know, Richard, we live in an abundant country. We live in a wealthy country. We, we do. live in a very comfortable country, right? And, it's and a very safe country, and too. And a very safe country. And it's our privilege, right, to welcome people. In, exactly. Right? And it's our moral mm -hmm. obligation. Mm -hmm. Now, how, mu how much does it cost uh, your, your group to, to resettle a family. What, and tell me how your fundraising goes in, in Brantford. Sure, so we've been fundraising now for probably the last four or five months. Um, every person on the, on the volunteer list has reached out to their contacts to ask for help financially. Mm -hmm. To date, we've raised $32,000. Wow, um, most that's, much, that's much more than you really were required. Much more, right? originally Iris said to raise about twelve to 15,000. Wow. But we mm -hmm. know we um, live in an expensive town, right? Mm -hmm. And we're gonna expect rent to be about $2,000 a month. Mm -hmm. So we want to um, help the family, not enable them, 
because the goal is self-sufficiency. Right. But we do want to get them settled, help them find a job, transportation, connect them to schools and ESOL. Um, and ESOL so, is what? Uh, English is a second language. Is it for right. for the parents or for both both parents and children and children? Right, mm -hmm. right. And are some of your volunteers involved in the yes. ESL classes? Right. Well, I, our our beefiest committee is the education committee. You know what? I'm on that committee. You are on that yeah, committee, am, yeah. and you know, and let's know to your point. Ev education is everything. It the all starts with ed education. Right. Yeah. Uh huh. And and tell me something else. Uh, um, what is um, what is the government doing for the program? Talk a little bit about the federal government and what their commitment is to, to the refugees. Sure, sure. So, so IRIS provides training for us, right? So we're mm -hmm. very clear about what we're expected to do mm -hmm. and what we're not expected I to do. I want to talk about that too. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we'll get some um, federal funding for each um, refugee that arrives. I believe it's 1,025 per person. Per person per month? Per, no, just one time. One time. One time. Oh. And then we will get some assistance from the state mm -hmm. in the in healthcare, mm -hmm. in the, the Husky name of Husky program, program mm -hmm. right? And then um, food stamps and SNAP. Mm -hmm. And SNAP. Right. Now, d doesn't the state? Well, it's, I don't know if the state, but who does the, the the health screening? Because every refugee has to have a screening for their health, don't right. they? Right. And that will be done uh, through IRIS. Through IRIS. Right. I see. Do they involve Yale University Medical they do. School? They do. They do. Yeah. Uh -huh. I see. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now, so well, it's it's a powerful mm -hmm. collaborative, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's uh, all hands on deck. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Let's look a little bit. Well, from the from the training that I took to be a volunteer, and all the volunteers are required to do a three part training, aren't they? They and are. It's, Six and it's, hours. It's a wonderful training. I I was in the Peace Corps, so I'm familiar with the resettlement process because I went through that in Brazil when I was a Peace Corps volunteer. Right. So knowing that that's being attended to by IRIS and by the volunteers is also a very good thing, I think. Yes. And and what, what struck me was that they had a four-part uh, cultural development process that the refugees go through. First is honeymoon period, right? Yep. How was that for you, the honeymoon period? I'm still at the honeymoon period. You still yeah. are, okay. <laughs> Love that. Talk a little about it. Love it. It's a time that you come, everything is uh, like it's hard too but uh -huh. if you have hope and dreams you think right now you are at the stage that you can do whatever you want mm -hmm. your hope full of hope and wants to do anything you want and mm -hmm. start writing what your goal are from 10 years from now mm -hmm. which i think i'm achieved that those goals wonderful and it's you're happy excited and wants to do more for yourself and your community and mm -hmm. for your family. Mm -hmm. uh, is the stage you think everything looks wonderful. Right. Okay, let's go to the next stage. And I, I'm told this is the hardest stage, and this is culture shock that people go through when they first come here. Tell me, what, what's the reason for, what, what was your experience, and what do people you know, have the most difficulty with when they, when they come here? The language is really different, mm -hmm. and okay. if you come to an, the time is like a new event, and you don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. For example, if you come uh, in a time it's like a Thanksgiving, and you don't know about it, mm -hmm. it's kind of new for you. But yeah. when you think deep about it, we have such a similar things in our culture as well. I see. Uh -huh. We sheep, uh, we sacrifice a sheep but American people sacrifice uh, Turkey. Oh, that's and right. The point is, all get together and enjoy the time. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, like I showed you in the introduction mm -hmm. with that family, the Garmal family reuniting with their cousin in Mansfield, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. The next stage is adjustment, where you try to figure out how things work here. What, what, did you, what kind of adjustments did you make when you got to that stage? Uh, l like at the beginning, it was hard to get to education system. That was something I love to do it, mm -hmm. and I'm sure everyone loves to learn and go to school. When you get to stage that you are registered for the university that you want and uh, start to learning new things, finding new friends, my phone mm -hmm. was empty. There wasn't any no number. Mm -hmm. At certain stage, when I had, uh, uh, you know, a phone full of numbers. That was like, yes, I, ha I know many people now. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about I things like taking the bus and sort of navigating the everyday life of, of the community? That was an adjustment, wasn't it? That was a really uh, big adjustment for mm -hmm. myself to, mm -hmm. because for two years we didn't have car. 
no driver license. Mm -hmm. And after two years when I got driver license and then was able to drive around and mm -hmm. do my work independently, mm -hmm. that was a big adjustment for mm -hmm. myself mm -hmm. and my family. Did you have an adjustment with, with we're, we're so geared towards the internet and with our computers. Was that also an adjustment for you? Uh, internet, maybe it's different for myself. Mm -hmm. um, I used to have such as this internet and access to technology. Uh -huh. Because that was my work. I was teacher there and I was also uh, principal for a big school. I see. It uh -huh. was weaker than here, really weak, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. a still I had. I was known mm -hmm. such a distance. And the last stage is mastery. When you feel confident that you can go about your daily life with confidence and with success. Did you also have a mastery period? I mean, when you felt okay about being here? Uh, that is stage I'm still trying to be. Mm -hmm. For myself, I feel I have to be more engaged with the community, with the political environments, with the, mm -hmm. you know, to learn more about what's happening in surrounding me. Any events is in my city, I try to join and learn from everyone. It's mm -hmm. different for each people, where if they accept you for that community or not, but that stage is not ending. Always you want to be mm -hmm. in the community and learn mm -hmm. new things. Yes. I remember when I was in Brazil in the Peace Corps, the mm. first year was difficult yeah. because I had to learn the language and I had to learn how the culture functioned and how I could function in the culture. So that first yeah. year was difficult. After the first year when I could understand the language and communicate, mm. things were a lot easier then and I kind of knew how the culture worked too. Yeah. But it was exactly. a very steep learning curve in the first year. Yeah, exactly. First year is important. It's like a mm. You're like a baby who mm -hmm. comes to the new world. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Exactly, and exactly. You have to learn tell us, everything. Tell us a little about Elena's Light and, and why you started that program. I came myself as a refugee with my mother here. We were two uh, women. We were uh, happy and uh, welcome with a lot of great people, great volunteers. They helping us and it was a really great community. Mm -hmm. um, but when I graduated from uh, Southern Connecticut State University in public health, I had my internship with IRS, which... I remember that, mm, yeah. Yeah, later I became a health coordinator at IRS for three years. Mm -hmm. um, Were you paid for that job? Yes, that was mm -hmm. my that was your job. full-time job, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I started also teaching at University of New Haven, tutoring at Yale wow. because of the language skills I had. Mm -hmm. um, then I was in reach of seeing a lot of refugee families and also, in the other hand, a lot of good students um, mm -hmm. And I just a matter of connection. I had to connect mm -hmm. these two groups to help them for the yeah. language. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember, uh, I was also medical interpreter at Yale Newman Hospital. Mm -hmm. One day was extremely cold. Mm -hmm. When I went there to help a family to translate for them, I saw a woman with two disabled children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The weather was extremely cold and mm -hmm. they were all the faces were red. And she was shaking. And wow. I asked her, like, what's going on? What's happened to you? She said, my caseworker last minute canceled. She cannot come to take us to the doctor appointment. Mm -hmm. It was hard to find a bus. I was waiting 30 minutes. The bus didn't come. I decided to walk. Oh. They both mm. walk. Like, the kids were five years old, six years old, but mm -hmm. they couldn't walk. Mm -hmm. She had to put them all in the stroller and walk. Push the, push mm -hmm. the stroller push 45 the stroller. minutes in the mm -hmm. cold. 45 minutes in the wow. cold and come to the hospital. She said, we were waiting for this appointment for four months. I so, really couldn't So her it. story made a big impression on you. That was, I asked her, why are you not getting driver license? She said, who going to teach me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I need someone to help me yeah. for that. And it, then that was mm -hmm. the story. I said, okay, let's do something. Mm -hmm. Nice. How can people get involved with Elena's Light to support your program? Um, there is several ways to do that. Uh, we are always looking for volunteer. Mm -hmm. Before I had all local volunteers because it was in-home classes one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. Right now we have it more uh, online. It's one-on-one -on -one and mm -hmm. online with the Zoom or WhatsApp. We need more volunteer for the ESL classes, mm -hmm. uh, teaching more volunteer for the like the admin work because mm -hmm. Eleanor's Light is uh, still a, a volunteer organization. Um, we're always looking for um, fundraising and looking mm -hmm. for, uh, you know, support us because... Did, did you get your citizenship? I got my citizenship. Yeah, what too. was that like when you, when you got your American citizenship for you? What was your, what was your, what, what was your reaction to that? It's really um, awesome after 30 years mm -hmm. of living in the earth, uh -huh. you have an identity. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. 
and uh, and Laura, getting back to you, yeah. tell me a little bit about how uh, the the co-sponsorships helps families with their schooling for their children. Sure. Because that's that's a new whole new field for most people. So, right. the educational people facilitators have to really work closely with the families, don't they? They do, they do. I mentioned that our biggest committee is our education committee. I think we've got eight or 10 people on that committee. Mm -hmm. They've already been in touch with the superintendent. They've already been in touch with, we have three elementary schools in Brantford. They've been mm -hmm. in touch with all three mm -hmm. uh, and they will be connected to um, uh, ESOL classes mm -hmm. as well. Great, yeah. great. Let me ask you, we're kind of wrapping up now. Sure. Tell me, how, do pe how can people listening and watching our show get involved with with your uh, co-sponsorship committee in Brantford? Sure, so um, if you go to the IRIS website, they have every single co-sponsorship there, mm -hmm. including Brantford, mm -hmm. uh, and that way you, you'll find us. Um, we have we have met our um, financial um, goals, but we certainly need physical donations right now. Mm -hmm. Our family is hoping to arrive in January, so we need warm clothes. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't know where our family is coming from or, or even how big the family is, but we do mm -hmm. need physical donations, including furniture and clothes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And you know, you, you, you told me once about uh, Natasha's clothes in in Brantford that that had a sale, and all the re returns went to your program. That's right. It was um, it's Homemakers Thrift. So oh, fifty okay. percent of their sales uh -huh. go go to our cause. We uh -huh. have Cynthia's Flower Shop in Branford. They had um, Solidarity Saturday, so wow. all the money they raised came to our cause. Mm -hmm. We've had um, a 12-year-old found foundations, girl. Foundations have we, helped you we're too. We're thankful t for the Branford Community Foundation. Mm -hmm. They gave us an emergent grant, found, mm -hmm. um, emergent need grant. Mm -hmm. um, the Branford Micro Fund is our fiduciary. So I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's a major community collaborative. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Um, and wonderful. I'm proud to be a part of it. Wonderful, wonderful. I would like to thank Laura and Farishta for telling us about your work with refugees in, in Connecticut. Uh, it was a pleasure having you on the show tonight and, and hearing your stories. And I would like to thank our viewers, too, for, for tuning in tonight. I hope you learned something from our, ta our conversation tonight about refugees and what they're, what they're experiencing and how you can help out. And, you know, having refugees come to our country is a cherished national mm -hmm. tradition, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad that it's alive and well in Connecticut, where we have so many volunteer community groups stepping up to really help people coming to this country from Afghanistan, from Syria, from some of the other Congo, I think, mm -hmm. and some other countries. Right, so right. it's a real... They have much re, to teach us. It, yeah. They have a lot to teach us. They That's do, right. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. My pleasure. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Yeah.